Welcome to another Morning Coffee Guest. I'm your host, Simone Absalom. Unrelenting, skilled, persistent, and courageous. And those are just some of the adjectives used to describe the Charles Town Maroons. Today, we look at the upcoming 11th staging of their conference and festival. Stay with us. The Charlestown Maroon Conference and Festival is a premier event on the calendar of the Charlestown Maroons and signifies the peace treaty signed by the Windward Maroons and the British in 1739. We are joined by a member of the Charlestown Annual International Conference and Festival Planning Committee, Ms. Carol Miller, to discuss this year's celebration. Hello, Ms. Miller. Good morning. It's really wonderful to be here. Oh, we're so <laughs> glad you're here. So tell us, when and where is the conference? As you've just said, it's the 11th Annual International Charleston Maroon Conference and Festival. It's going to be held at the Asafu Yard in Charleston. And Charleston is just a little bit out of Buff Bay. For those who know, Buff Bay is in Portland, my parish. The oh. parish where we get a lot of water and rain. And the absolutely divine, beautifully I would think it's wonderful. very pretty down yeah, there. That's I love right. the and to have this conference there is even, you know, um, so much more stimulating because Portland is a parish that is really loved by many many people it is. just just the atmosphere the um Asafu Yard, the Charleston Asafu Yard is located in the foothills of the Blue Mountains really because you know they were also instrumental in having that um the Blue and Jonquil Mountains declared a national site by the UNESCO so that's that's part of their backyard in a sense so that's the location of the conference, a really exciting location, a beautiful space that has a lot of beautiful energy in it because it's a space where on a weekly, daily basis, you know, the maroon community interacts. There's drumming and singing and dancing. Many other activities happen there. So it's a space that is really already pre prepared and energized for this conference. When is it? The conference is June 21 to June 23. There is so much that's exciting about this year's conference, one of them being the, um, the topic, the, the theme of the conference. We agreed on a theme of peace. Because of relevance, there is a lot of, um, can I make a word, non-peace happening in our land today. Um, you know, we, I don't want to give too much energy to some other words, but we're not really living the peace that our forefathers, the Maroon people who, who, who fought brilliantly through the Maroon Wars. They were fighting for something, and today we're not having that opportunity to live what they fought for. So we thought it was a good time to examine that, to look at peace, and see how we navigate that as Indigenous peoples, because you know the Maroons are an Indigenous development in the Jamaican space, and the Maroons the, the, the whole Jamaican community actually comes from indigenous peoples. The Taino people who were here first were indigenous to the space. The many Africans who came were, were indigenous to their spaces. The Chinese Indians were all indigenous to their spaces. So they all gathered together with indigenous thinking, indigenous ways, indigenous practices. It's interesting that you speak about that. You, you signed a peace treaty so long ago and we've hardly heard, well I've never heard, in the news, um, anything, any non-peace happening in the community. Share with us, teach us your thoughts on keeping the peace in a village. All right. Well, the, the non-peace that we talk about, you know there's been an upscale in violence in Jamaica over the past um, more than a year that I can remember, where it's become, you know, we would say more than it usually is. And this, this is cause for concern in many, many different ways because you see, you can tackle problems from many different directions. And I think one of the directions we don't look at sufficiently is the teachings of the elders and the old ones, the ones we call ancestors who have gone before, like Kwao, who is celebrating this, this practice. He had a way of life, a way of thinking. And indigenous people had ways of thinking that promoted peace. And even though sometimes you have to bring, as I say, you have to fight fire with fire, when, when violence raises its head, its head, sometimes you have to put violence, you know, conflict, um, wars in place to restore that balance. And so when we look at 
who watch our ancestors, the, the maroons of the past, the, 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 the Tainos who were the first ones enslaved in this space. Then came the Africans who were also enslaved. And put, you know, that was a kind of violence that was put to them. And they, they responded. But how have we sustained that response? The treaty itself is a celebration of a victory. It's not just a treaty that sits there, okay, these people signed the treaty. It's a treaty that exists because the British realized that they were being outmaneuvered left, right, and center. So strategy by, is key. That's right. By the brilliant strategists among the people who are here, the Taino people, the, 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 the Akan people, and, and the other African groups. I say Akan because Kwao himself is from the Akan community. And they, they were employing military tactics that were far superior to the British. They had them whipped. A, a, a man who is winning a war doesn't ask for a peace treaty. They were the ones who initiated this conversation for a peace treaty, asking for a peace. So the peace treaty says, our people, we call them ancestors, we call them forefathers, foreparents, whatever we call them, were brilliant warriors, brilliant strategists, and that they had a commitment to peace. They had a commitment to freedom. They had a commitment to certain kinds of lifestyles, to certain kinds of indigenous thinkings that promoted the fact that people should live in peace and harmony. We shouldn't be oppressed, not by others, not by ourselves. And we should live with certain thinkings. We should care for the children. We should care for each other. We shouldn't bring violence against each other. And one of the things that's interesting to me is like, I don't know that there's ever a community without violence, but if you look at the nature of violence among what we call indigenous people, and you look at the nature of violence among some other people, like the people who came here to Jamaica in the times when there was first contact with the, with the Taino people, the nature of the violence that they brought was nothing compared to what could have been described as violence among those people. I mean, they used to settle a fight with a ball game. These people came with guns. These people settled a fight with a ball game. That was the violence. I'm fighting against your team to see who's going to win so we can say this is how the dispute is settled. This is a solution. So no, a no one lost settled. their lives, no, 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 no reprisal, no, no anything. No, it's not like a fight to the death. Exactly. Kind of. No, no, no. But the kind of evil, kind of, yeah, you know, my words are kind of strange sometimes. The, the nature of the violence that was now imposed on them, being enchained, being, you know, that whole income in the system of, of slavery was really cruel. I mean, the beatings, and, and to think that we still have some of these things on our laws, you know, beatings. Well, so flogging was removed some time ago, but it was really horrible. So the nature of the violence is completely different. And so the tactics needed to fight that were also different. So our, our people got into their warrior mode, and they did what they did. The British were losing this battle. They asked for a peace treaty, and so we celebrate. Not just to say we celebrate the peace treaty, but we're celebrating the efforts and the achievements of the people who fought to the point where somebody had to say, surrender and wave them red flag, <laughs> the, the white flag and in speak, the shape of a peace treaty. Speaking of the focus and the theme of this year, quickly I want you to share with us the, the various focus key areas. You, you have said that you have a theme, peace, right? That's right. But then you have certain areas that you'll be splitting that theme That's into. Right. Quickly tell us about the, the that. The conference, as is normal, um, spans a number of areas. It's, one, it's unique in the sense that it mixes academic work, it mixes culture, it mi mixes um, art, what, what you can, it, it's really alive in that it covers various aspects of our lives. And that, that that's in itself is instructive in terms of how the community has grown because the celebration started out as just celebrating the ancestor. But we have to be relevant. So some of that has been taken and reformatted into present day formats and ways to attract people and to teach and get the people to understand what's happening. So the academic um, days, which I call it the conference part of the, the, the conference, happens on the first two days, Friday and um, Saturday in this case. And it's really, oh my gosh, how do I say it? International and local participation. It's organized into panels. And we have panelists from Africa, Canada, the United States, Jamaica, um, you know, and, and probably even further afield, who come to participate in this conference to prepare research papers. The, the, the panels are at all kinds of different academic levels, you know. So we're going to have many panelists coming in from, from various areas. That's right. All right. And areas in terms of geographical areas, but also areas of study. So we are going to be looking at um, 
let me see if I can make this simple. We're going to look at, for example, how indigenous people negotiate peace. Exactly. We're going to look at things like what is happening in present day world globally that threatens indigenous rights. And we talk about human rights, land rights, environmental rights, all the rights that you can think of. Because there's, there's a way, for example, when indigenous people claim the rights of nature, that a river has rights, that the trees have rights, that people scoff. But that's very real to the indigenous person because the indigenous person honors nature and all the aspects of nature as part of everyday life. The water is important. And the question of how a human being needs supersedes the needs of the river that therefore then gives permission somehow to the human being to throw plastic in the water. So we find fish with plastic in their bellies and to throw dirty paper and just garbage in a river becomes very confusing to the indigenous thinker. Very, very confusing. How does that work? The water is sacred. The creator created us all. We are relatives. You have to take care of your nature. You have to and take care of your take relatives. Care of, exactly. You have to take care of your relatives. And it will take care of you. What happens if water disappears? You know some rivers are going underground. What happens if they all go underground? Because we believe that they're alive and we believe that they fight back. Science has proven, for example, that when you're cutting a tree, that that tree sets signals to the other trees in the air to say, I'm under attack, we're under attack. If they have that kind of intelligence, why would they not know to fight back? And one day, who's going to suffer? The whole place, we're going to suffer. Everything will be destroyed. It's interesting the way you speak about this. The academia, they look at it as dangerous to biodiversity, um, issues surrounding climate change, That's right. threat to our ecosystem and stratosphere and all that. But you keep it simple. It's a threat to our brothers and sisters. That's right. In life. That's right. Definitely, definitely. Authentic maroon traditions will be on show That's right. as well at Asafu Yard in Portland. When we come back from the break, we'll be continuing the discussion. We'll be looking a bit more on the academic side of the conference. Stay with us. Our slogan says we are the people's station. And for more than 10 years, PBCJ has been providing unique content to this growing market. Let us show you how we can serve you. We are small compared to our competitors, but it's our size that gives us the ability to dedicate ourselves to our clients. We move your project from concept to completion, keeping our activities in-house so we can make decisions in a timely and efficient manner. We have a creative, energetic, and youthful team ready to take your ideas to the next level. So what can we do for you? PBCJ has mastered the art of feature presentations, studio interviews, and PSAs. We also stand ready to create content for your social media platforms and make your message accessible anywhere, anytime. We also provide streaming for your conferences, seminars, and workshops. And guess what? You don't have to break the bank because our fees are some of the most competitive in the market. And just when you thought it couldn't get any better, we air it free. You heard right, we air it free for you. So call the PBCJ at 876-754-7225 or email us at production at pbcjamaica.org. We are waiting to serve you. Welcome back to Morning Coffee Guest. I'm your host, Simone Absalom. Every year in June, thousands gather to celebrate the rich maroon traditions in the staging of the Charlestown Maroon Conference and Festival. A large part of those celebrations is the academic papers that are presented. Ms. Carol Miller, planning committee member is still with us and we were covering some bits of the the academic papers that part but what I want to find out from you in terms of academic is the historic aspect one of the days is being recognized as Kwau celebration day tell me who was Kwau so just for clarity I just like to just kind of smooth that out a little bit yes the conference and festival covers a number of um, days 
and um, we have these that are dedicated to various um, topics, themes, on the general theme, of course, of peace. The first two days are the academic conference, and this year, um, the Kwao Day celebration and the Maroon Victory Day celebration celebration are merged because Kwao Day, which is always the 23rd of June, that's the day of the signing of the peace treaty, fell, falls on the Sunday, which is normally the Victory Day celebration. So now it's a merger to create a really vast and exciting day. So Kwao, the foundation of course of all of this, is an ancestor of the Maroon people and of Jamaican people. Kwao came from Ghana in West Africa. It's commonly thought that he came from the Fante people, who are one of the groups of Akan people. What people think about a lot in terms of Jamaican history is that the Asante people came here. In Jamaica, we say Ashanti. I say Asante. The Asante people came. And we know about those because they were a really fierce set of people. They were confident and they were themselves brave and strong. And if you know your history a little bit, you'll know that there was a time when the, 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 there was actually um, consideration of legislation to not allow the importation of Asante people. Of course. Because the slave masters were very afraid of them. They couldn't but control them. But the Asante people were also the best workers. So of course you know which side the, the decision fell on the side of the money. So they continued to, to bring these people in. That's why we've ended up with all of these kind of things we've, we're comp, you know, kind of contemplating and struggling with our space today. Because the Akan people who came, whether they were Asante people or Fante people or any other groups of people, Bono Akan or any of those, were very fierce people with very powerful spiritual practices that helped them through wars, through fights, through issues. So Kwao was one of those um, spiritual, I'm almost tempted to say entity because he was really bigger than himself in so many ways. But um, spiritual forces that came into the space, himself and his brother and sister, came into the space to do a job. And that job was to enhance and facilitate that fight for freedom that fight for peace, that fight for coexistence in this space that today we call Jamaica. So Kwao, we know that about him. His name is derived from the Akan practice of giving day names. So Kwao, being born on Thursday means he comes with certain attributes. Some of those attributes are things like courage, um, bravery, and aptitude, and ap almost like an appetite for war for fighting. So he already came, or shall I say, predisposed for this job. Who is? There's not, there has not been a lot of academic scholarship on that. But the Maroon people, they know their ancestors. They, it's not about, you know, what somebody else says. It's about knowing because living with ancestors and venerating ancestors, the Akan people, the Chinese, the Indians, all the people who have come to this place are people who know that you honor and venerate your ancestors and they know who they, who they are. They don't need, you know, textbooks to tell you who they are. It's, all, it's nice though sometimes to have that kind of documentation, not to deny that in any way, because for those who need it, it provides the, how you'd say, validity? It provides some sort of robust scholarship that says, yes, th this did happen. And so those, those who probably operate in other time and space will, will appreciate that. So both, both are kind of needed. But the celebration of Kwao by the Charlestown people, Captain Kwao was the one who, in terms of geography, navigated that area. Old Crawford Town, if you go back to the history, Crawford Town, to Old Crawford, the, all of that area, um, Spring Gardens, that, the whole area. He was... Um, Grand Nanny, and I call her that with respect to Colonel Harris of, of, of uh, you know, may his soul rest in peace. Amen. And um, he, he, he always said to me, you know, that's what we call her, Grand Nanny. So I call her that. And the, she, Kwa was one of her captains. So his responsibility, under her direction too, was that area of Charleston. So he has become the hero, the maroon hero of the Charleston people, the one they honor and give praise to as an ancestor, but more importantly, as the one who was alive and led battles. Some people think that leading a battle is only about the military part of it, but no, it also en en encapsulates managing people. How do you keep people engaged in war when people are dying? How do you keep them focused? How do you keep them spiritually balanced? Kwao did all of that as a leader, as a Maroon leader. He did all of that. He kept his men robust, spiritually, physically, mentally, to be able to do what they needed to do at that point in time. So he celebrated. He celebrated, and he celebrated by, and, and, and with him, 
we celebrate all the ancestral energies of the place because we cannot ignore the ancestral friendships. It's not the done thing to ignore ancestral friendships. Kwao couldn't have done it alone. The African people could not have done it alone. The Taino people had to show them where the caves were, had to show them various medicines that were particular to this land. They had to share, they had to create friendships. They were indigenous people like they shared thinking. They may even share practices. Certainly if not in this manifestation, certainly in its essence. But they were people of one mind. Of, what, of knowing that they needed to respect God, they needed to respect water, they needed to respect the environment, and that they needed to fight for peace. That nobody should oppress them, that nobody had that right or that privilege. Nobody should take their lands and claim it in the name of somebody they don't even know. They know that that wasn't to be done. They knew that they had to say no. And so this celebration, the, the whole conference and festival came out of that recognition of the Charleston people, the members of the community, that this is something who sh that should be honored for now and for all the times to come. So Kwao is a role model. He's dead, but he's alive. He's dead in the flesh, but as an ancestor, he's very alive. He's there to remind the people that in seeking peace, they need to strategize. They need to be brave and that they can maintain. And you know, it, it is generally said that the Maroon communities and some other those other kinds of communities in Jamaica have lower crime rates than other communities. So you ask why? Well, that might tell you because they honor their ancestors and that wouldn't be a strange response because we know, we know. How many times you, some, you hear Jamaica say, you know my father dreamy, me and didn't tell me this, this, this. <laughs> we know they work for us. Oh, I'm dreaming and tell me a lot and I'm me by the time I get this. Ah, oh, duh. So are they dead? Are they not doing things for us? When you honor them, they turn around and help you to, be, to protect your space, to protect your environment, to guide, to teach, to help you to solve the problems. So these all contribute to that conversation on peace, even the honoring of the ancestor, which is a normal practice for Taino, for Akan. And as I say, all the people who came here, I don't know of a group of people who came here who did not have a practice of honoring those who brought them here their four parents. So that, that's a major part of the conference. There's a wellness section because wellness is also, I mean, if, you, if you're peace, you, you need to be well to be able to, operate, to appreciate that whole state of, of, of peace and, and freedom and enjoying that and to you know, enjoy it fully. So we have a wellness section where you have um, live food demonstrations because your, your diet is a, you know, an important part of your wellness where you have... Um, Touch modalities, there's healing, healing modalities, hands-on modalities, music, um, all kinds of exciting things. Things you have never seen before in terms of healing space are there for you to, look, to experience. What about the food? I read oh, that, you know, wow, wow, the wow. maroon tradition in terms of food and preparation. Right. And you know that good. that is a tradition that also is ancestrally linked. It has come right down and keeps... Um, being indigenous in a sense in that you're always creating new dishes. So this year, one of the things I'm hearing about that I have not had yet is like crayfish rundown Ooh. and crayfish soup. Of course, we have the, the staples of the maroon community, the, the, the process of jerking, which is a, a way of preparing food that was taught to them. Again, during those times when the ancestral friendships were being created by the Taino people, because that's how they would prepare food in the space. And so there's going to be your jerked this your jerk, that chicken, pork, and all, everything else that they can find to jerk. There's going to be things like escovitch fish. Do you know how escovitch fish got to Jamaica? I bet you. I give you ten cents if you answer me correctly. Um, 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 um she don't know the okay, answer. Okay. It was brought here by the um the Spanish Jews. I was going to yes, say that escovitch fish. But guess what? We take all of them things and Jamaicanize them, don't so it's free now. <laughs> so in the maroon community space, you will find a lot of these things that came. That you know some of the things that we we celebrate things like um. The use of um, things like codfish were part of that, that trade in enslaved um, Africans, you know, so all part can, of that. We can expect uh, tours so you can show us some of those um, yes. places. Tours are an are ongoing part of the landscape of the Charleston community. On an everyday basis, they have tours to Sambo Hill. So, you know, walk in the path of that, walk in the footsteps of the ancestors, walk in the path of the ancestors. And they have the museum tour. They have a really fabulous museum that shows um, quite a bit of their history and culture. And, you know, one of the things we have to stress is the display of maroon culture during the conference, the drumming, the singing. One of the things we're going to have on the, for example, Ancestor Kwau Victory Day is what I call ancestral rhythms. And it's a coming together of drummers to really make a joyful sound 
for the ancestors and have people dance and just release the, all the stress the, and bother. The, the, the celebrations, it's open to the family in general. The Everyone celebration can attend. The celebration is open to the public. Everyone can attend. There's an entrance fee of $500 for adults, $200 for children. Could it come any less? No. That's yes. I really should be 5,000 and 2,000, shouldn't it? <laughs> For yeah. what we're going to learn. For what you're going to get. Yes. It actually is priceless. priceless. But we have those token fees and we ask everybody to comply because these help, these, these bunnies, they may not be large, but the, the ancestors tell you, one one cocoa full basket. And so they help. They do help to contribute to the next conference or to amenities or to cover expenses for this conference. Usually they're not enough to stretch anywhere, but we value them because they help. And it's also a respect. Of, it's a respect you give something to, you know, along with your presence, your time, your contribution. So Sounds we're like looking forward to a fabulous 11th Annual International Charleston Maroon Sounds Conference exciting. and Festival yeah. in the Asafi Yard in Charlestown, just outside of Buff Bay on June 21 to 23. Are you coming? Of course, of <laughs> course, of course. So there you have it, folks. Come out on June 21 to June 23 at Asafi Yard in Portland. Let's celebrate our maroon traditions. Until next time, I'm Simone Absalom. See you in Portland.